What's up artists? My name is Ryan Talbot and today I'm going to be showing you how I generated these detailed landscapes using World Creator, Redshift, and Cinema 4D. We'll be using tools such as the Redshift Material Blender and high quality polygon textures to achieve this look. Let's get started. All right, so here we are in World Creator and the first thing is to figure out how to navigate because that's kind of important. So if we hold down Alt and right click, we can actually orbit around the center of our landscape. So that's cool. We can scroll in and out with the mouse to zoom in and out. We can also use WASD to move around kind of like a first person shooter. And if we hold down right click while we're doing that, we can look around and change the direction that we're flying. We can also hold down shift while we're doing WASD and that's gonna allow us to move around even faster. Um, so that's pretty cool. Oh, also, Q and E. So Q will go down and E will go up, and that's part of the whole WASD thing. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna start editing the base shape of this. So I'm gonna come down to my custom base shape properties, turn that on, and click Edit Shape. And you can see right away we get these diamonds to work with. So I can start pulling these up, um, but I don't really feel like this is enough detail for me to work with, right? So I'm gonna turn up my terrain width up here in the terrain size to something like 4,000. Um, and now we have about four times the amount of points to work with, which is great. And now I can start pulling up these mountains. And I feel like this is a pretty good size for me to work with. And I'm just doing this to add enough variation so that when we start adding filters, um, we have a better idea and a better sense of what we're doing. All right, so let's say we're happy with that. I'm gonna hit done editing shape and I'm gonna come over to my filters tab and I'm gonna add a layer. And the first layer I want to add is under the rigid tab, the small sharp ridges filter. So I'll hit okay and you can immediately see we have some nice mountains going on now. And if I turn down the general strength, you can see what that's doing, you know, and uh, we can turn that filter off altogether as well. Cool. So the second filter I want to add is a wind filter. So I'll hit add and we'll go down here and I believe it's under erosion and we're gonna select wind and we're gonna hit okay. And you can see right off the bat that this is covering the mountains evenly and it's sort of just throwing it over the entire landscape, which we don't really want. Um, so what we want to do is we want to limit this to uh, the concave regions. So let's go into cavity right here and instead of none, let's select concave. And now um, it's no longer affecting our mountains. It's only sort of affecting the base region and the floor, which is what we want. Um, so I'll turn up the length here um, to start seeing what's happening. And you, this kind of creates a cool exaggerated effect uh, maybe this is something that you're going for. Um, I'm gonna personally turn this down a little bit for this video, um, but you know, feel free to experiment and do whatever you, your heart desires. Uh, so there's only one more filter that we're gonna do, and that's another wind filter. So I'll hit add, and I'll select wind again, and this time I want to rotate it around 180 so that we get it coming from this direction and this direction. That way. We kind of get this, I want to create this nice swooping effect um, that goes like that in between all the mountains. So we're going to put this one into the concave cavity once again. And you can see if I turn this off real quick, what that's doing. So now if you look at this mountain side right here, it's adding that same erosion and it build up along the edges of the mountain, uh, just like we have on the left side. Cool. So that's, um, that's pretty much it for generating the landscape. Uh, there's not a whole lot to it. The next thing we want to do is we're going to get into texturing this guy. So let's go over to our texturing tab and let's add a new layer. And the first layer that we want to add is that underlying rock. So let's hit add and we're just going to choose a color that best represents what we're going for. Uh, because one thing to keep in mind is that we're not going to be using the world creator textures in our final render. We're actually only using this as a purpose to create mats so that we can completely redo the textures in Redshift. So don't worry too much about all these tiling settings right here um, or anything like that. 
This is just for the general color. So uh, let's say this is our underlying rock, and then on top of that, we want to lay down some sand. So let's add another texture, and I'll choose this one right here. And we can see it's covering everything evenly, which we don't want. So let's just come down into those settings, and under cavity, um, one thing you might think is, oh, I'll put this in the concave cavity. And this is technically uh, doing what it's supposed to, you know, it's adding sand in those dips. But the problem is, um, it's not throwing over a nice sheet of sand over everything. And that's really what we want to do. So let's turn that off, and let's go down to slope select. And if we start bringing down this value here, you can see we're introducing sand on the floor. And as the angle gets sharper, um, that rock starts to poke through. And that's exactly what we're going for. So you can dial this in to whatever value works best for you. I think maybe something like this is good for me. That way we have, we can see that sand sort of uh, fading off into the rock, which I really like. And I think it creates a lot of nice detail in this region as well. And so you can see this is pretty simple. Um, I might go back to my base and edit the shape a little bit more. One thing that's helpful to do is raise up the edges of your world and create some dips in the center. Um, that way, when you sort of come in to render your scene and you fly in here uh, to do your render, there's not really any areas where, like right here, where you can see that it clearly ends. Uh, we want to raise that up. Um, let's see if we can do that from here. I might need to zoom out. Uh, we want to raise that up. That way, no matter which direction we're looking, there's always an interesting landscape to look at, and we don't see it fall off into nothingness. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And I think that's looking pretty cool, actually. Um, I'm really liking this, so I'm going to hit Done Editing Shape. Um, and there's one more really cool filter I just want to show off. Um, so we're going to add one more filter, and this one is under Design, and it's the Path Filter. So what's really cool about this is that we can customize our landscape even further by adding a path. So I've added a path, and then I'm going to hit Edit Path down here, and it tells us uh, all of the hotkeys to create our path. So to add a path, we're going to hold down Left Shift, and we're going to mouse click. And we're just going to keep clicking to draw that path. And you'll see why this is really cool in a second. So let's say I want to create a path that sort of going up the mountainside here, right? And maybe it sort of winds around and it goes up on this side and then it winds back around here and then it ends. All right, so when we're done, we can hit Done Editing Path and we've created uh, some nice ledges here. So now uh, this is just another level of customization. You know, we've created these nice plateaus uh, that weren't there before, and if we turn off our path, we can see what a difference that is making. Um, maybe I'll add another path. Let's let's add another path, and I'll edit that. And I'm gonna left click while holding Shift, and I'm just gonna draw this path up here, and I'll make this one extra windy. You know, so it just kind of like winds around this mountain until we get something like that, and then I'll hit done and look at that uh, so there you go um, just another really cool feature of world creator so when we're happy with our landscape which I am um, it's time to start exporting this thing so we're gonna go over to our export tab and we have a few settings here um, you can see we're exporting a height map um, I've already selected OBJ from the list of formats here. Um, you could also export a displacement map, for example, as a PNG or a JPEG. Um, but I'm going to do an OBJ. Um, and we want to make sure that this landscape geometry is optimized, right? So let's head back over to our surface and our base tab. And we want to make sure that our precision is set to 1 meter and our resolution is 4,000. Um, and that's going to make sure that we're exporting at a decent size that isn't going to crash Cinema 4D, but still has a good amount of detail. Um, I'm also going to select quads to optimize our geometry even further. Um, essentially, if I didn't have that checked, we'd be exporting a bunch of triangles, which would essentially just double the number of polygons.
So the final thing I'm going to do is export this at half resolution and then I'm going to hit export and I'll just overwrite that one that I already did and I'm going to let it do its thing. All right, so the next thing we want to export, um, if we come over to our texture tab, is this splat map right here. Now remember, uh, we're not using these actual textures. Um, this is just a representation of our mats. So a splat map is going to give us a file that we can then separate into two different materials in Redshift. And for a splat map, I actually want to make sure that this is double the resolution of what we exported for our geometry. Because luckily, Cinema 4D can handle really high resolution textures. So let's come over to our base again, and I'm going to turn up the precision here. And you'll see this a little bit better if I zoom into one of these areas right here, um, maybe somewhere like over here. And if I turn this up to 1 4th meter precision, it's going to take a minute to recalculate, um, but when it's done, you'll see that it's going to add some more detail um, into these texture breaks right here, which is what we want. And at this resolution, you can see we're going to be exporting a 16K map, and that's going to give us some nice crisp detail um, for our materials. So let's go back to our export, and let's export that splat map at 16K. And I'm going to overwrite that old one, the Targa file. And that's gonna take a minute to do its thing. All right, so we're checking out our splat map in Photoshop. And as you can see, we have an unholy level of detail here. We can literally zoom in and it's still extremely high resolution. So that's exactly what we want because when we're looking at this from a first person perspective in the world, uh, we're gonna need all that extra detail. Um, so what we need to do next is we need to separate these two colors from each other. So I'm just going to create a new layer um, and I'm actually going to hit Control J to duplicate our background um, so we just have that as its own layer now. And let's make a selection. So I'm going to go up to select and select a color range. So I'm going to select this green right here and my fuzziness is set up up to 200 so it'll kind of feather out that selection based on the color and then I'm just gonna hit this add mask button right here and now you can see we have all of our sand I think that's the sand or maybe it's the mountain we have one of our materials isolated right so this is great because now we can right click on it and we can go to blending options and we can do color overlay and we can just make this pure white um, and then all we have to do is make a new layer and make that completely black. And since it's a 16K picture, it's going to take a while. <laughs> so I'll just drag that underneath. And now um, we have our mat. So we can take this into Redshift next. And we're going to take the Material Blender and we're going to blend two materials together. So let's just go up to File. And I'll export this as a PNG real quick and we don't need transparency and it's chugging along because the file's so freaking big so we're just going to drop that into our world creator folder and i'll call this splat map black and white boom all right so now that we're in cinema 4d um let's bring in our object so i'm going to hit shift Control o and i'm just going to merge in my height map and it's going to take a minute to load. You can see in the bottom left corner, it's loading all those vertices. And this is why we optimized our, our mesh before we exported it. All right, so we finally got our geometry loaded in. And we can see uh, we have lots of nice detail in here. Um, but there's a couple things that we need to do to fix this up. So you'll notice if I actually zoom in here, um, we get a lot of really ugly uh, tearing. Um, and a lot of this is actually due to the Fong angle. Um, so all we have to do is just select our Fong tag and turn up that Fong angle to 180. And that's gonna smooth out most of those problems. Um, but you will still notice um, at the top, um, we have these very ugly jagged edges, um, which depending on your camera angle um, may or may not be an issue. Um, but what we're going to do to smooth those out is use a smoothing deformer. So pretty straightforward. We're just going to drop that in, make it a child of our landscape. 
and you can see right away um, it smooths it to 100%. And the problem with that is that now we have no detail in our landscape. So we're gonna we're just gonna find a happy medium here, and I'll start with 15%. And I actually think that looks pretty good. So you can see like in this area, especially if I turn this off, we have all these ugly jags. But if I turn this back on, it smooths it out pretty good. And once we drop our materials on the landscape, it's going to hide all that extra ugliness anyways. So that is pretty good to go. Next, we're going to dive into texturing our landscape using Redshift. So the first thing I want to do is I want to pull up my Redshift IPR so that we can start looking at this in the render view. Um, so let's load that up real quickly. Um, and then the first thing I want to do is I want to start adding some lighting into the scene. So I'm just going to drop in a dome light real quickly. And I'm going to load in an HDR, which I got off of Polygon. So this is just a sky HDR with some clouds. Since it is a 16K file, it does take a little bit to load the texture in. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do to set up our scene is I'm going to switch over to Redshift in our render settings and we'll go over into our GI tab and I'm going to change this to brute force and I'm going to change our secondary GI to brute force as well and I'm going to turn up the number of bounces to six. So that's going to give us um, a much more accurate lighting model to work with. So now that we have some light going on in here, um, we can see that it's way too bright. Uh, let's also drop a Redshift camera in here and real quick, I'm going to turn on uh, the exposure override and enable this. And I'm going to change our f-stop to something like 12. And that's going to help us see a little bit better um, what's going on in our scene. Why don't we drop in our redshift material and start texturing? So we're just going to drop in a regular redshift material and drag it onto our landscape. Delete that default one. And it's going to take a second to load because the geometry is very dense, and we'll rename this Landscape. All right, next we're gonna jump into our material, which you can do by just double clicking on that material, and we'll, we'll get this shader graph right here. But instead of making this full screen, I'm gonna hop over to a layout that I created specifically for this video, and that's just gonna allow us to see both of our landscape and a clear view of our node graph in the same screen. So um, we have our material here, and the first thing we want to bring in is a material blender. So I'm going to drag that in. And why that is so amazing is because we can plug in our black and white mat in here that we created. And we can duplicate this material right here. And I can rename this one, for example, rocks. And I can rename the other one, sand. Um, and then basically we're just going to plug these into our material blender. So one's going to be the base color and the other one's going to be layer one. And then this material blender is going to be outputted into the surface. And voila. Um, so why don't we start with building our rock material? Um, so the other half of the secret sauce is to just use high quality materials. So I found the materials that I'm using for this project on polygon.com. I'll just show you the folder real quick. So I'm going to be using Cliff Desert 04 for the rocks. Um, so if we open up this guy, um, we can see that we have a color map and we have a normal map, which are the two most important ones. Um, and we also have a reflection map and a gloss map, etc. So I'm going to start dragging these maps in one at a time. And we'll start with the color map. And we want to uh, plug this into the diffuse. Probably help to turn on the Redshift IPR. So right away, we can see our rock color being applied to the whole thing, which we don't want. And let's look for that black and white splat map we created. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to bring this in. I don't want to copy it to the location. And I'm going to plug this into our material blender as the layer 1 blend color. And now you can see that our rock texture is being restricted only to the areas we want. And for the sand, I'm going to be using uh, this one, which is also from polygon.com. And I'll show you what that's looking like. So this is our color map. Um, we got a displacement, which we won't be using. Um, and we have this normal map, which is going to be very important to creating those ripples. So I'm going to start dragging the color map in first. 
and just so that we can get an idea of what's going on let's just plug this into our diffuse quickly um, so that we can start seeing what this is looking like so now we have two separate materials um, and you can see where this is headed so let's start dialing in our rock texture some more the first thing I want to do um, if I actually come in closer to one of these mountains we can see better how it's mapping um, and first of all I'm going to come over to our rock material and I'm just going to turn the reflection down to zero um, and if I zoom in on this you know we can see that there's actually some odd stretching happening um, because of the way that the texture is being projected so what we're going to do is we're going to reproject this as triplanar so we're going to search for a triplanar node and we're going to drag that in and all the triplanar node is it's essentially box mapping it's, it's the same thing as cubic mapping except it will feather the x y and z edges into each other to create a more seamless transition between the textures so i'm going to plug this into our texture image x and then i'm going to output the color back into the diffuse and now we have some triplanar mapping happening so we need to change some scale settings since this texture isn't a perfect square and from doing this tutorial before I know that these values are 0 0.003, 0 0.03, and 1 although this looks like it's stretching a little bit so why don't we actually change this and that looks like it's looking better next I'm gonna bring in our normal map so here we go and for the normal map we need to put this through a bump map node so I'm gonna drag that in and I'm gonna plug that into our input and we're gonna change this input map type to tangent space normal um, and then we want to also put this through triplanar so let's just hold control to duplicate that node and let's plug that into image X again and this time we're gonna plug this into overall bump input all right, so now you can see our normal map is adding a little bit of extra detail into our texture. So another thing that we can do, um, because let's say we want to adjust the scale of both of these textures at the same time, it would be kind of a pain to come into this triplanar node and adjust the scale here and then come into this one and then copy the settings over. So what we can do is we can uh, go search user data and we can bring in a scalar user data node and to make this much easier to understand I'm gonna rename this and this is just gonna be scale so now we're gonna plug this into the scale of both of our textures so now um, you can see we just it's scaled it up so big that we can't see anything so we're gonna change the the number here in the scale node um, let's start with one and see what that looks like and now you can see we're back to what we had before so if I want to make this smaller, I could turn up the number to three, um, and you can see that is scaling both the normal and the color map at the same time. So I'm gonna put that back at one because I actually thought that looked pretty good. Um, and now why don't we do a little bit of color correction on our rock texture? Because I want it to be a little bit darker and less saturated. So I'm gonna bring in a color correction node, and let's plug the output into the input of our color correction node and then output that back into our triplanar. But the first thing I'll do is I'll just bring down the overall level scale um, and I'll start messing with the gamma, bringing that down. We'll desaturate it a little bit and that's already looking much better. So I'm actually gonna keep that value for now. Maybe we'll saturate it a little bit more, make it uh, bring down the gamma a tiny bit until we have something like that. And I'm actually pretty happy with that right now. So why don't we do the same thing for our sand material now? So I'll zoom into one of the more sandy areas of our image. Um, and now you can see we have this nice detailed rock texture, but our sand is looking kind of bleh. So um, the first thing we need to do is we need to bring our sand into a triplanar node. So I'm just gonna control drag to copy that once again pipe that into image X and then output that into the diffuse color one more time and once again I'll turn the reflection down to zero um, that way we can see better what we're doing um, and then I will also copy our scale and let's pipe that into the input for the scale on our color texture 
Now, it's hard to see any of the ripples right now because really all of that detail is happening in the normal map. So let's go back to our sands material and let's bring in that normal map once again. So I'm going to plug this scale into the scale once again and we're gonna output this into a bump map. So I'll just copy that over from our other material and we're gonna output that into a triplanar node once again. And then we're gonna output that into our overall bump input. Cool, and right away you can see we're starting to get these nice little ridges happening in our sand. Uh, one thing I just realized is that our sand map is actually a square. So I'm going to go back into these triplanar nodes and make sure that these are all scaled at the same amount. And I do feel like the strength of these sand ripples can be increased. So I'll just head into that bump map node and I'll turn up the normal to three. And now you can see we have uh, much stronger ripples coming through. Next, I think I'll start um, looking for a, a nice composition here. So I'm just going to zoom back out a little bit, um, and that's that's looking pretty nice already. Um, let's just try and find a cool, cool little render. Uh, maybe something like that could be pretty cool. So I'm going to jump out of this, and I'm going to jump back into my redshift view. Um, so that we can see what's going on again, and I don't have everything up on the other monitor. Um, so this is going to be our composition, and we got our camera set up. Uh, why don't we put a little bit of fog in here? So I'm going to drop in a redshift environment right here, and you can see uh, this is what's going to allow us to put fog throughout the whole scene. Um, so now uh, what we have to do is turn on our IPR so that it loads. And once that's loaded, uh, we need to come into the dome light here and we're going to go to this volume tab and we need to tell it to contribute to the volume. So we're going to turn that up and you can see now we're just being blinded by white light. So let's hop back into our redshift environment and let's actually turn down the scattering to a really low number until we get uh, something that we can see better like this. Um, and we can also change the tint. So let's say we want this to be sand particles in the air. Um, we could tint this slightly yellow and that's going to look more like a sandy desert. Um, if you wanted to go for some cool like Blade Runner effect, you know, you could make it red. Um, you could you could really do anything with this. Um, so I'm just going to keep this uh, keep this slightly tinted yellow. And I think that looks about good. So I'll come back over to my dome light and I'll actually turn down the contribution scale a little bit more um, until we just get a very subtle, subtle effect like that. Another really cool feature of Redshift is the ability to save snapshots. So if I click on this plus button right here, you can see we've just saved a snapshot of our IPR. Um, and if we change something about this scene, for example, if we turn off the environment and remove the fog, uh, we can we can compare that back to our snapshot and see the difference that it's making. All right, so I just made a couple quick adjustments um, and I took a snapshot so you can see this is what it looks like before and this is what it's looking like now. So the first thing that I did was I went into the redshift environment and I turned up the phase. So uh, this is what the fog looks like at a phase of zero. Um, and when I start turning this up, you can see that the volume becomes more concentrated um, in the right corner where the light is actually emitting from. So I think it just sort of sharpens up those volumetrics and it makes them become a little bit more directional. Um, so that's the first thing I did. Um, and then the other thing that I did was I just brought down the exposure of the sand color a little bit and I just did that using the same exact technique we did to color correct our rocks. So I just brought that brightness down a little bit and here you can see the difference. There's one last detail I want to add to this landscape, and that is some puffs of dust scattered throughout the sand dunes. And we're gonna do that with the help of the redshift volume object. So we're gonna come down and we're gonna add that into our scene. And we're gonna head over to this path right here, and I'm gonna start importing some VDBs from the Mitch Myers Mega VDB pack. And this is a great pack because it's got a few different categories to choose from. So I'm gonna be using the smoke category and you get a nice little preview for each VDB, which is also pretty cool.
So let's load in VDB smoke number two. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna lock this camera in right here. So I'm gonna choose RS camera and that enables this lock icon. And now I can jump out of this camera and I can move around while still looking through this angle in the IPR. So I'm just gonna zoom in to my volume here and we can see it's really, really tiny. And all we're seeing is this box right here. So to get a better representation of what we're gonna be seeing, um, let's head over to preview and let's turn this on to points. And I'm going to turn up the number of points to something like 150. And now you can see we have a very detailed representation of our volume, which is great. So I'm going to scale this up to something like 200. And we'll just move this somewhere into our scene where it would be seen by the camera. Even though it's within the camera's view, um, we're not seeing anything because there's no material applied to this volume. So we need to create a new volume material. So we'll come down to materials and we'll add a volume material. And we're gonna drag this onto our volume. And you can see we're still not seeing anything because we actually need to jump into our volume and start setting this up. So I'm gonna head over into my uh, node layout and we got our volume material right here. So the first thing we wanna do is turn our IPR on and I'm gonna lock my camera in one more time and then under the channel right here, we're going to select redshift volume and density. And that's just gonna tell it to look at the density of our VDB object. So I'll zoom in real, real quick and I'll turn on our render region so that renders a little bit quicker. And right now um, our volume is looking a little too dense. But before we go any further with that, I'm going to go to my render settings and I'm gonna turn up the resolution of my scene here so that we can see this volume a little bit better. So there's two values that we're going to be manipulating here. And the first one is the scatter coefficient. And the second one is the absorption coefficient. The absorption is essentially the density of our volume, while the scatter is the overall brightness of it. And these values go hand in hand with each other, meaning if you reduce the density, you need to reduce the brightness of it to compensate for that. So I'm going to reduce the absorption coefficient to something like 0.01. And once that updates, you can see uh, our volume is much thinner now, but because of that, it's way too bright. So we're gonna come to our scatter coefficient and we're going to bump this down to something like 0.05. Um, that way it's just a little bit brighter than our absorption. Um, and that gives us a nice smoky look. So I'm going to turn off our render region real quick. And I'm gonna move this volume over so we can see it a little bit better. Um, it shows up much better when it's in front of the mountains. And you can see that's kind of what I'm going for. So that's all for setting up our volume material. I'm gonna jump back over into my Redshift layout. That way you can see what I'm doing. And we'll turn on our IPR once again. All right, and let's lock that camera one more time. And now I'm just gonna art direct this a little bit and start moving this to a place uh, where it would look cool. And we also, we wanna keep in mind uh, where these puffs of dust would realistically be in our scene. So they would be sort of coming off of the edges of our sand dunes, you know, they, they wouldn't necessarily be like in the middle of this rock right here where there's no sand. So um, let's start moving this around until we find something that we're happy with. And I want this first one to sort of be in the foreground uh, maybe coming off of this ledge right here, I think would be a cool look. And now you can see we got some cool uh, dust puffs happening in the foreground. So now I'm just gonna duplicate that volume and we'll come into our volume object and replace it with a different VDB. So this time um, I'm gonna choose smoke number five and you can see this is like a much bigger dust cloud. So I'm gonna select that VDB, open that up so let's move this farther into the background. And that actually looks kind of cool. I like the idea of it sort of coming off of this ridge right here. So I'll, maybe I'll just move that down a bit and rotate it around. And that's looking pretty cool. So let's duplicate that again. And maybe I'll move this one back uh, even further so that it's sort of like coming around the mountain. And I'll scale this 
down so that they're not all exactly the same. Let's try 50. And really just have fun with this um, until you get something that you're happy with. Now you can see we just ran into an issue where our HDRI suddenly got brighter. Um, this tends to happen whenever you have multiple VDBs uh, going in your scene, and I'm not totally sure why. But I find that usually the problem can be solved if you just quickly turn off all of your volumes and then turn them back on. And now our HDRI is looking normal again. Uh, one more trick to add some variation into these VDBs is to scale up one axis more than the other. Uh, and that creates more of a sweeping uh, wind effect. So when I'm placing these VDBs, um, what I'm doing is I'm adding depth to areas that we couldn't really tell existed before. So for example, if I zoom in, um, we can see that this rock face here is clearly cut out from the background because that VDB is behind it. Whereas before, um, it looks much flatter and we can't really tell if there's any space behind this rock. Same thing right here. Um, this kind of just looks like one flat rock face, but when we turn on that VDB, oh, we can see, look, there's a little ridge right here that we couldn't see before. Um, and so we're keeping that in mind when we're placing our VDBs, and I think this just adds that extra level of detail that we're going for. So that's going to conclude today's video. Um, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to leave a comment, and I'll see you next time.